Now the band is uh, at that point. The band was had had undergone some changes. Uh, Rick, was that Roy Montrell on guitar, and because Papoose had already OD'd? Right, right. And that, actually, that uh, oh. that Ed Sullivan clip was very significant because uh, um, what had happened was that uh, they were in New York City in um, March of 1962, and it was. Uh, Mardi Gras time, basically, and I don't know if Pat Poos was celebrating or something, but he did OD on heroin. And um, so this was like uh, four days before the Ed Sullivan show, so it was kind of a big emergency. <laughs> and they, they didn't want it to get out that he had you know, OD'd. And uh, so uh, Billy Diamond told me that he had actually had the guy from uh, Jet Magazine um, put him, he died of a heart attack. So I don't know if they had any other news of it anywhere, but um, they apparently hushed it up because it would have been a bad to be canceled off Ed Sullivan. And they called up Roy Montrell and he flew up, I think he was in Scotlandville uh, near Baton Rouge at the time. And um, he flew up to, to uh, join the band. He had played with them briefly before and he played with Fats another 17 years before he OD'd, uh, also on the road. And uh, anyway, the, this was essentially the same band that Fats used through most of the 60s. Um, Dave actually wasn't with him on a regular basis. He would play with major gigs and different whatever he wanted to. But uh, this is a, you know, pretty much a 60s band, and this, several of them play, had been playing with him since 1957. Uh, I'll go through try, trying to describe them try, so you can probably re hopefully remember. The shortest guy is a guy named Robert Buddy Hagens, and that's actually Fat's original band member. He joined him in 1946. And, uh, is that right? I guess, yeah, that's about right. He started to do little gigs in the ninth, lower ninth ward. And um, so he was with Fat's for over 25 years, or about 25 years. And um, then uh, Herbert Hardesty, he did the majority of the solos in there, and he joined Fats uh, on records in 1949 and did a tour with him, and then permanently joined him in 1955. <laughs> um, the, the tall guy you probably know is the great Lee Allen, who played sax solos on almost all of Little Richard's records. And he played the major solo there on uh, Ain't That Just Like a Woman, putting a little Chattanooga choo choo in there. And, uh, and uh, then Clarence Ford um, also joined Fats in 1957, and he's kind of underrated, but he was a multi instrumentalist and very good. And uh, when Lee and uh, Herbert later left, Clarence Ford became the main soloist. And, uh, you know, did a lot of the same things that Herbert had done on trumpet and even uh, flute. And then the drummer is uh, the other earliest man. His name is Cornelius Tenu Coleman, and he joined Fats in 1951. He stayed with him until 1967 when Fats went to England. He didn't want to fly to England. And then uh, the bass player is Jimmy Davis. He joined around the same time as Clarence Ford in 1957 and stayed with him. 1970 when he died in a car wreck, and uh, that's about it. They, basically, Fats Band changed up totally in 1970, and the only guy left from that band you just saw was Roy Montrell, and, and he was with him, like I said, another nine years, 79 when he OD'd. The, the one thing is, if I, if I know Rick, and this is what the significant is, that T. New never really recorded sessions with Fats, I thought. He did some. Uh, yeah, see, the thing is that uh, Fats did a lot of sessions in Los Angeles, and uh, so he was using his road band for the most part. So like on Ain't That a Shame and uh, Blueberry Hill, which were recorded in Los Angeles, actually, uh, that is Fats' road band playing. And, um, uh, you know, it varied up in New Orleans. I can't say for sure on all of them, like Earl Palmer was on drums and I'm Walking and some of the other sessions, but uh, Tanu did get in a few gig, a few sessions in New Orleans. But uh, Dave Bartholomew got mad at him from uh, when he did the original version of Let the Four Winds Blow in 1955 with Dave singing 
because he he uh, lost the beat and he, he speeded it up as it went along. He's, he actually mentioned that to me when I interviewed Dave about that. So uh, Dave didn't uh, didn't give him a break, and, I, and he started. He when Earl left, he started hiring uh, Charles Humphrey Williams on drums instead. And then later, Smokey Johnson and uh, and uh, Bob French also did show scenes with Fats. So Joe, it was a, and it was an odyssey to get this uh, to thing. What happened when you showed Fats this footage? Actually, um, I'm not sure if he's actually seen it. Uh, we actually may show it to him today, uh, um, if that works out. Um, I showed it to Herb, uh, who loved it, because uh, he, you know, like I said, it's, it's just so unusual to see a sustained, full performance. And same thing with Dave. Dave loved it as well. In fact, uh, they saw it together at one point, and, and I, I got them to look at it that way to get them to remember some things about the tour when we were interviewing them. So, you know, they were they were kind of surprised that it exists. I tell you what I really love about it is, you know, it's so clear in this footage about the parallels between, quote, rock and roll and rhythm and blues. I mean, that's a rhythm and blues band. It really is. There's one guitar solo, okay? And as we know rock and roll, but I know it's, but it's just amazing to me because it really is, it's just a slamming rhythm and blues band, you know? And, but it got called rock and roll because that's what was happening at the moment, you know? The interesting thing about a lot of those records out of New Orleans and Fats, and this just goes to show you, is there's always crazy guitar parts when you don't expect and They seem to just come out of nowhere and people, you know, I mean, Papoose Nelson, who unfortunately wasn't in that footage, and then the, on, on some stuff, and then of course other you know, the session guitarists, Justin Adams and Ernest McLean. It's like New Orleans guitar players would be these amazing players, but the solos would be just these like things would just come out of nowhere on the records, and it's like, where did that come from? And it's... So do we have any more question, audience questions from the audience for Joe or Rick? <coughs> Uh, at the end, Fats didn't push the piano across the stage. Rick, when did he start doing that? He started doing that in the, the later 60s. Uh, maybe uh, it was right, right before he went to England, I think, because he did it when he went to England in 1967. I think, did John Proven come back? I, I, anyway, I was hoping he would be here. But anyway, uh, I was going to, uh, John, I would love to hear you or anybody else uh, from Europe and your... Uh, thoughts about uh, seeing Fats for the first time, if you can come up to a mic. But quickly, I want to say that this was a pivotal concert. This was a very significant concert, uh, just as the Ed Sullivan was significant because he just lost his papoose, who had been his guitarist since 51, uh, and replaced him with Roy Montrell. Uh, he also, Fats was running out of hits. <laughs> he had basically had scored his last big hit, which was Let the Four Winds Blow in 1961, and he had a few minor well, top 40 hits in 62, but uh, he was looking for uh, you know something to sustain him, and uh, he uh, what actually sustained him during the 60s was Las Vegas, and he went to Las Vegas for nearly six months out of each year. But uh, this was the first concert he ever played in Europe, and. Um, which is very significant, and you saw the bewildered Frenchman <laughs> as their second lining around the thing. But the thing is that <laughs> uh, and so there was actually, as John put in his wonderful book uh, 35 years ago, whatever it was, that uh, there were actually a few jazz purists that were heckling them <laughs> because it wasn't a j it was a jazz concert, okay? And and uh, but also the fact that um, uh, this. He went to England in 67, but he wouldn't really cash in thoroughly on Europe and for a decade after this concert. And, and, and at 73 is when he started going regularly to Europe, and he went there for the next 30 years. Uh, well, 20 years. John. Rick, uh, first of all, congratulations, Joe, on discovering that film, an absolutely wonderful Thank you, John. piece of history. Uh, I would like to credit the French for having the the foresight to actually book Fats and his band and actually uh, film the, the performance. Um, uh, way ahead of their time, in a sense, uh, uh, Ray Charles and his band were, and his orchestra were going over to France um, about the same time. 
and I've already opened the floodgates. But uh, April 1967, Fats Domino and his orchestra at the Savile Theatre. The first time Fats Domino was in England. And I have to say, the excitement level was just unbelievable. Fats had a lot to gain, but he had a lot to lose. To us, he was our great hero, and we literally knew every note of every record. The band came on. I can still remember behind a gauze screen, you could see the lineup. You couldn't see their figures, their faces. The band went into an instrumental introduction, and it was noisy. And I thought, what's happening here? And then all of a sudden, Fats hit the opening note of Blueberry Hill. And I tell you, it was heaven. <laughs> and from that point on, Fats could do no wrong in the concert. And looking at the personnel in, in Joe's film, uh, Lee Annam wasn't there. Nat Preliat took his place. But Clarence Ford, Buddy Hagen, Herb Hardesty, Roy Mantrell, James Davis, different drummer, Junie Boy. But the point was that Fats justified, if you like, his legendary, his heroic status. And as Rick quite correctly said, for the next 10 or 15 years, uh, Fats and his band came over not only to England, but to Europe, uh, promoted by a guy called Patrick Malin, and really did so much to spread, to spread New Orleans music uh, throughout Europe. And I'd just like to finish by, by saying that um, we had a seminar yesterday saying, how do we promote New Orleans music? I thought it's very noteworthy that the name of Fats Domino was not mentioned once. And yet Fats, to me, is a symbol of New Orleans music, New Orleans rhythm and blues. And for New Orleans to have, if you like, a fixture, yes, you've got Louis Armstrong, you've got Dave Bartholomew, you've got Alan Toussaint, but for heaven's sake, put Fats Domino up on that pedestal yes. because he was the man, along with Armstrong, who spread New Orleans music throughout the world. But Rick, thank you for giving me the chance of... Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the chance of extolling the virtues of that wonderful first concert at Savoy Theatre. Thank you. Thank you.